Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This morning I woke up to a video of Rocket Lab's Peter Beck eating his own hat, as he has often promised he will do, in response to questions about things like, will Rocket Lab ever go public? Or will Rocket Lab ever build a reusable rocket? Um, so yes, this was part of a bigger sort of PR push because Rocket Lab are becoming a publicly traded company that you can buy stock in, Although they're not doing it via the traditional process of an initial public offering, instead they're being acquired by a type of company called a SPAC, that is a special purpose acquisition corporation, a shell company that is created just so they can sell stock in it and then use the money from that to buy a real company so that the people that spent the money on the company, or the stock, actually have a useful company. Um, it may sound weird, but apparently there's a lot of rocket companies doing that, including Astra did this exact same thing about a week ago. But, you know, being able to buy stock in Rocket Lab, that's one thing. What I'm more interested about is the fact that they announced plans for a new rocket called the Neutron, which will appear, will be supposedly ready in 2024. It will be a medium lift rocket capable of putting about eight tons in low Earth orbit. And so obviously Neutron follows on thematically from the name Electron. I'm going to point out though that since Proton is unavailable due to Russians, uh, I would have gone with, with muon, because then you've got electron, muon, and tau, they're all leptrons, and they all get bigger and heavier. It would have made so much more sense, but hey, whatever. Yeah, there's not much information out there, although we have had heard a few things. It's going to use a lot of stuff that's already been tested on the electron, so they're going to use... Uh, kerosene and liquid oxygen as the propellant. They're going to use a two-stage design. The launch site is going to be Wallops in the west coast, oh, sorry, the east coast of the US. Uh, a lot of the electronics they will be able to reuse, but that's about it. It's going to be a lot bigger. We've seen a fairing mock-up, which is supposedly 4.5 meters across, and a rendering, which is very low quality, but would imply that the rocket is about 40 meters tall and, uh, well, uh, may have four engines, but that really doesn't make sense. So based on that, I think that they're probably still trying to figure out what kind of engines they put on it. And I'm going to say that's kind of concerning if your first launch is aimed for 2024, because developing rocket engines can be quite complicated. The first stage will be reusable. It'll be fly, uh, launch the second stage, and then land on a barge using propulsive landing. Um, if they're going to reuse this, then it probably puts its wet mass at launch at about 300 tons, maybe? Eight tons to orbit is about half of what a Falcon 9 does in reusable. So it's, well, or actually it's, it's not even that, it's, it's about half of what a Falcon 9 does in uh, RTLS. So I, I think uh, this will be a much smaller and stumpier rocket, but equally, even although its payload is a lot smaller, it's still going to be able to launch about 90 something percent of payloads. So it will nicely fit into that market and compete well with the Falcon 9 if they can get the, keep the money down. Now, yeah, the choice of engines is not clear right now. With uh, the Electron, Rocket Lab developed an in-house engine called the Rutherford. Rutherford was, of course, an atomic physicist from New Zealand, so had a lot to do with the Electron. Uh, for the Neutron, maybe they'll name their engines the Chadwick, after James Chadwick that discovered the Neutron and worked under uh, Rutherford. But honestly, we don't know what's, what to expect here because electrically pumped engines are great when you have very small engines because it's very hard to scale down the turbines efficiently and make them operate on, on such small scale. But when you're trying to produce engines that need, you know, it, like 100 tons of thrust, that it's much, makes much more sense to use a traditional turbo pump design, at least on paper. But, and I say but, if you're going to be landing a rocket, then you need really good throttle control, and electrically pumped rockets are really good at throttle control. 
On the other hand, if you've got electrically pumped rockets, then you need to have batteries for all of those. And if you're recovering your rocket, that means you're carrying all those batteries with you. So maybe they develop a full turbo pump system. Maybe they get high efficiency, you know, staged combustion or tap off cycle. Maybe they do some sort of hybrid design where they've got a bunch of high performance turbo pump engines and then a smaller electrical pumped engine. We don't know what's going on here and I don't think we can really read any conclusions into this. But 8 tons to low Earth orbit does let us figure out that probably can put about 1.5 tons towards Venus and maybe 2, kilo two tons towards the Moon. Uh, based on the height and the 4.5 meter diameter, that does make it pretty short and stubby compared to the Falcon 9. In fact, at its height, it is very similar to the Antares, which also launches from Wallops. And in one comment, Peter Beck said that it will launch from a launch site next to the electron pad at uh, Wallops, right, that's already there. And there's only one pad that's already there in that position that's next to Electron, and it's the Antares. And I'm going to say, this is too much of a coincidence for me to not point out. Eight tons of orbital you know, payload is pretty much what Antares offers, right? The first stage of the Antares is kerosene and liquid oxygen. So this might almost be positioned to take over launching the Cygnus from the Antares, because... The Antares, while it was designed by Orbital Sciences, who are now part of Northrop Grumman, it's not built by them. The Antares, the first stage is built by a Ukrainian fabricator and it uses Russian engines. So it, although the second stage is definitely an Orbital Sciences, your know, Northrop Grumman thing, it might actually make sense for them to switch over to a domestically produced medium lift vehicle, which is reusable. I don't, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it does seem strangely coincidental. One other thing that actually shows up in the render, by the way, that I haven't mentioned, is that the Electron was the first fully composite material, you know, carbon fibre composite, that was able to reach orbit. But they've had problems getting enough of this material and manufacturing it, which is why they started looking at reusing these rockets. But the rendering for this shows a silver colour, so maybe this one is getting away from the carbon high-tech composites and they're switching over to aluminium or maybe even stainless steel, who knows? But um, in terms of looks, it definitely looks short and stubby compared to the Falcon 9. And that's actually an interesting data point because the Falcon 9s are narrow enough that they get driven down roads and they're a lot easier than some larger payloads. Uh, you know, when you get things that are really large, they need special attention on the roads. But Falcon 9 can just about make it through almost any set of roads. You go much larger than that and you have to start taking down signs and things. So because transportation of this wouldn't work over land, over roads, it sounds like they're looking at making the factory be near to the launch sites. They would probably have somewhere you know, near wallops and the factory that's building at least the propellant tanks. It might be that if they're building engines in house that they can build them at their factory in California and then ship them across the country for final assembly. But something as big as a tank uh, stage, you definitely would want to build that close to the launch site. They're going to have to have uh, recovery ships. They're going to have to have uh, you know, all the other infrastructure there. But yeah, they can use existing launch, a lot of existing launch facilities. And yeah, another point they said was, by the way, that it will be human rated. And of course, that doesn't mean that they're developing a human capsule that will go on top. But it means that since it's within the capabilities, since you know the mass of some human rated capsules are about eight tons, it would make sense for them to make sure they could do it. Now, in the US, there's two crew capsules that are currently flying. One is Crew Dragon, the other is Starliner, and those have launch masses of about 13 tons. So these are beyond that eight ton capability. Although, if you look at it, if you squint at the numbers, I think it might be able to carry a Starliner into orbit if it was used in expendable mode, although it might need some more help from the Starliner's thrusters. But uh, 
Soyuz is about eight tons. The Indian Gangayan is about eight tons as well. Soyuz, of course, is very cramped and has terrible leg room, but the reason for that is because it had to fit on top of the R7 rocket. And so they had this very long, thin spacecraft with the orbit module, the descent module, and the service module. Since this is way wider, they could definitely address the leg room issues and have a much simpler vehicle in that pad. But I don't think anyone's building that. I just think that's there as a potential customer. But it will be able to cover a lot of satellite payloads and it will keep them in the launch market. So while, it, while Rocket Lab really are doing a great job in the small sat market, they are kind of headed into a very competitive landscape. Virgin Orbit just demonstrated that they can put uh, their Launcher 1 in payloads into orbit. And we have uh, Astra almost getting to orbit. Uh, there's people like Firefly, Relativity, and a few others who are all get sort of muscling in into this small sat space. And so having a medium lift launch vehicle that gives Rocket Lab more versatility and more long-term uh, you know, viability in the market. Of course, long-term, everything else is moving on. We're going to see new launch vehicles from ULA and various other companies. And of course, you know, SpaceX would love to have Starship flying and being completely reusable, but we can't guarantee that that will necessarily displace everything that will fly on a Falcon 9. We still can't guarantee that Starship will work 100%. You know, there's always the possibility that there's flaws that are found. Um, the, and the other thing that Rocket Lab is losing out on is that Falcon 9 is taking a lot of their small sat market via rideshare missions. They just did this where they flew a bunch of uh, bunch of satellites into polar orbit, including 10 Starlink satellites. And, and actually, yes, I completely forgot that one of the things they pitched Neutron as was a perfect rocket for these massive uh, mega constellation projects. Because after all, if you're building a competitor to Starlink, you don't want to be paying SpaceX to launch them, do you? No, this sort of fits nicely in the, the range of, if people would use a Soyuz, you could use this. So yeah, it does actually compete really well with Soyuz as a satellite launch vehicle. So um, I could definitely see them taking some of that market, which is of course being lost. I, I, I mean, look, obviously Rocket Lab have to you know evolve to stay alive in a competitive market. And this seems like a perfectly valid step for them. I want to know more about the engines. I want to know more about the mass ratios and the designs. But for now, uh, I think that it's it's going to be something to watch over the next few years. And hopefully we'll see it flying. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.